Hi, my name is Dr. Ron Ehrlich and welcome to today's presentation. Mental health is a huge problem and a growing one, and I'm not sure that this current crisis will make it any better. It's a, an intractable, often very frustrating problem, which is often just managed and with varying degrees of success. Well, today we are looking at psychedelic therapies and we are very proud to be collaborating, ACNEM, with Mind Medicine Australia. So it is with a great deal of pleasure that I introduce and welcome Tanya de Jong and Dr. Alana Roy to ACNEM 2020. Ladies and gentlemen, it's wonderful to be here. I'm Tanya de Jong and I'm here on behalf of Mind Medicine Australia. With me is Dr. Alana Roy, psychologist and social worker. We're thrilled to be supporting ACNEM in this wonderful global initiative and look forward to introducing you to a new treatment paradigm for mental illness in Australia with medicine assisted, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. We'll start off with the scale of the problem. So at the moment we have mental illness at alarming rates and getting worse. Before the bushfire and COVID crisis, one in five Australian adults had a chronic mental illness with one in eight Australians on antidepressants, including one in four older Australians and an average of eight Australians taking their lives each day. It's estimated that one in two of us will experience mental illness in our lifetimes. Since this current pandemic, experts are now predicting that these statistics will increase by 20% or more. In fact, Australia is uh, second only behind Iceland, second bottom in the world in terms of, of our statistics. So there's a lot of work to be done here. But of course, this is a global epidemic of mental illness. And at the moment, we don't have the tools to treat this epidemic. In certain demographics of the population, the statistics are even worse. So we have ADF veterans and first responders who have a far higher incidence of a range of mental illnesses. And there are other sectors that also experience very high mental illness when compared to the general population, including vets, accountants, even lawyers, um, and others. The cost of this crisis is massive, $180 billion according to the Australian Productivity Commission last year. And adults with a mental illness are nearly twice as likely to be unemployed, as well as potentially homeless. And of course, the risk of suicide increases enormously due to a mental illness. Treatment outcomes, unfortunately, remain inadequate. There's been no innovation in treatment outcomes over the past 50 years. Alana, you might want to talk a little bit about um, antidepressants and, um, and current treatments for, for depression and um, why they haven't been as effective as they might be. And although we acknowledge that antidepressants can be helpful for some people, the, the majority of people with you know, trauma, treatment-resistant depression, anxiety, PTSD, they often act as a, a band-aid to the symptoms and are not getting to you know, the root cause of the condition. What we're finding is that the, the, the remission rates are very high once people stop taking antidepressants and also um, the side effects when they remain on them for, for years is, is pretty devastating. And, and what we're finding with the psychedelic assisted therapy is that the combined approach to these medicines and therapy is, um, is much quicker with less, with less symptoms and it's getting to the root cause and not just being a, a band-aid for these um, mental illnesses. And of course, PTSD is even harder to treat than depression and the remission rates are even lower. So we acknowledge that a more of the same approach is not gonna solve the problem. So we set up Mind Medicine Australia in 2019. We are DGR1 charity. We have no profit motive whatsoever. Our goal is to help alleviate mental illness. Our primary focus is on medicinal psilocybin and MDMA. And we'll talk further about those during this session. 
The goal is that these therapies become an integral part of our mental health system. So that if you go to a doctor, they'll say, well, not only are there antidepressants and psychotherapy as potential solutions, but there's also psychedelic assisted therapies and that the doctor will disclose the high risk remission rates and the low side effects, which lead to substantial improvement in mental health statistics and remissions, which is the most important thing that we actually get people healed and through the system. Our goal is also that these medicines are accessible and affordable to all Australians in need, wherever they may be based. We've put together a very strong board of directors ranges from the ex head of the armed forces to the head of psychiatry at the University of Melbourne and St Vincent's to Dr Simon Longstaff from the Ethics Centre who says that it's unethical for these medicines to be withheld from Australians who are suffering and we also have the former trade minister the Honourable Andrew Robb who has been suffering with treatment resistant depression for the past 43 years. We have a, a, a wonderful team of psychologists and neuroscientists and other disciplines. And then we have ambassadors who comprise some of the leading researchers and psychiatrists leading the research in this space globally. An advisory panel consisting of, well, that's a whole page there of psychiatrists, some of the leading psychiatrists in Australia and globally. And then we also have medical practitioners, researchers, psychologists, behavioral scientists, pharmacologists, lawmakers, religious leaders, um, from rabbis to Muslim imams and other relevant disciplines from anthropologists um, through to uh, all sorts of business leaders and philosophers. So why is everyone involved? Well, I think there's a huge recognition that we need to expand the medical treatment options as a matter of urgency for the millions of people who are suffering in Australia alone, let alone globally. And so we're talking here about medicinal psilocybin for depression and possibly obsessive compulsive disorder and addiction, and a medicinal MDMA for post-traumatic stress disorder and possibly treatment of addiction. It's important to say that these medicines are also now being trialled for a range of other conditions, and we'll talk about that during this webinar. The wonderful thing about these medicines that sets them apart from any other types of treatments at the moment is they only require two to three dose medicinal sessions in combination with psychotherapy. And that's in contrast to conventional treatments. So often people who are on uh, antidepressants will be on them for decades, if not their whole life, and they may have to attend psychotherapy for their whole lives. And of course, there's a high dropout rate to that and also a significant expense. The other thing about these medicines is that they're considered extremely safe in a medically controlled environment and are non-addictive. So in, a, in 119 current or recent trials, there have been no adverse events whatsoever. Both of the medicines have been granted breakthrough therapy designation by the Food and Drug Administration in the US to fast track the approval process. And this designation is only given where medicines are considered to be vastly superior to existing treatments available. So Alana, I thought you might like to talk just a little about the actual way that the, the therapies um, work and how they take place, the, the three stages, set and setting and so on. Sure, so as you can see in that photo, this is uh, um, taken at a hospital setting supported by very skilled psychologists with medical facilities and screening processes and there's three distinct phases there's the preparation preparing the patient medically psychologically um, with all the information required for the journey the acute medical experience as, as you can see in that photo and also the integration support after the journey and typically this occurs there's two or three dose set, uh, sessions and the emphasis of these of these journeys is to lean into the experience, non-avoidance and curiosity. And the experiences that people typically feel is um, compassion, insight, connection, their ability to sit with pain for the first time and trauma, and of course be su supported and guided by this medical staff. And many people rate these experiences 
in the top five most important experiences in their lives, a sense of oneness, expanded awareness, which persists. And we'll talk in this webinar about the fact that not only do people experience um, an incredible sense of wonder and oneness in these experiences, but this persists and they're able to then bring the insights from these experiences into their future lives and into their relationships and their work. And this is done through very important integration by psychologists such as Alana and others, professionals who can help these individuals to really integrate this experience so it becomes part of them, really. Would you say that, Alana? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So the strong safety record here that you can see um, is, is really important to note. And this graph is particularly important. This is a piece of research that was done in Australia last year by the University of Melbourne, comparing the relative drug harms of different drugs. And you can see there that alcohol in the blue harm to self, in the red harm to others is by far the most dangerous drug, yet it is fully legal and there's no limit on what quantities anyone can take. And you can also see up there cigarettes. Down the other end of the scale, you see MDMA and psilocybin. It's important to say that this is based on the experience of psychiatrists and psychologists and first responders. It's not based on quantity of use. Alana, did you want to make any other comment about this, this hmm. research? Yeah, and just, you know, that obviously alcohol is, is legal and, not, you know, almost celebrated in Australian culture, yet extremely dangerous and, and can be extremely dangerous and toxic to a whole range of mental illness, family violence. Yet we have these medicines which are in very safe, non-toxic and non-addictive when they're used in a, in a clinical setting. Thank you. So the patient testimonials are profound. This is only a, a small snapshot on our website. You can see um, more and more testimonials, which we're adding all the time. But a lot of people say that they felt like they went through 15 years of psychological therapy in one night. And I think Alana and, and myself, who've both used these medicines in legal settings overseas, um, have experienced that for ourselves firsthand, which is why we're so passionate about this work. Um, did you want to mention anything else in that context, Alana? Yeah, just that, you know, I've been a, a sexual assault therapist, particularly for 13 years and, you know, really value therapy, of course, because I, I do it. But from my personal experiences using these medicines in legal settings, um, I, I personally haven't been able to get to, to, to that depth with therapy um, alone. It was, it's the combination of therapy and medicines and, and many of all my clients that have worked with these medicines are really reporting these results, the, the depth and this, the speed of work that can be done when you're supported by a therapist and have access to these treatments. It's really quite remarkable. I mean, my own personal experience is that, you know, I'm the daughter and granddaughter of Holocaust survivors. And so I'm carrying this intergenerational trauma. And often it's really hard to pinpoint it because, you know, I had a very loving and wonderful childhood, but where does the anxiety come from? And, you know, how can we deal with this? And these medicines have been like opening this window that I've never been able to open before to actually learn how my mind works. And it's important to say that the word psychedelics actually means mind revealing. It's like peeling back the layers of the onion to continually reveal more and more about what you're thinking. Because we often, often a lot of what we're thinking is actually not on the conscious level, there's the subconscious thoughts. And it's amazing, amazing to think what thoughts we're actually thinking behind or under the thoughts that we are sharing with other people. So going to the clinical results, and this is, this is of course where the rubber hits the road. And as we can see on this chart, we see that the effect size for antidepressants for depression is D equals 0.3, that's on the Cohen scale, whereas psilocybin for depression is D equal 2.0 to 3.1, so seven to 10 times more effective than current existing treatments. We also see there the effect sizes for MDMA, for PTSD, and so on. Uh, these results are considered off the charts 
and you can see at the top of the, the chart there, the most effective treatments for mental illness show effect sizes of an average of about D equals 0.5. So that just shows you just how effective these medicines are. So why, does these, why do these medicines work so effectively? Big question that we're asked all the time. Well, of course, these medicines alter the communication between brain networks, such as the default mode network. And the default mode network is where we tend to default to. It's our rigid, repeated and structures of thinking where we go back to, particularly under stress. And in, this, um, in these diagrams on the right, they're representations of MRI scans of people with depression. And on the right-hand circle, you can see a representation of a depressed person who is experiencing very rigid, repetitive thinking loops. There's not a lot of connection going on there. Whereas when you have the intervention with the psilocybin, you have this massive reconnection of neural pathways, increased what's called neurogenesis, and also an increased neuroplasticity, that is the creation of new neural pathways. What this means is that patients are able to break out of their traditional and repetitive styles of thinking, feeling and behaving. And this promotes an active form of coping, restoring patient agency, where patients feel empowered to heal themselves rather than just popping a pill every day, which in often, in many cases, will actually numb them out rather than actually making them feel empowered to get better. Alana, did you want to add anything to that? commentary yeah, just that uh, you know the, the there's a wide body of, of literature emerging from around the world to support this science and the, the neuroscience is really suggesting that these medicines target pathways that really can't be targeted in many other ways opening up you know the whole brain to have access um, to thinking insights feelings emotions the subconscious traumatic memories that may never have been fully experienced. And as you can see in that image, you know, that's the evidence of the brain connecting in its, um, in its entirety. Full glory, the brain connecting in its full glory. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and um, these, these incredible trial results. So this is from a study at Johns Hopkins University. And not only do you see the incredible remission rates that take place, um, but the persistence of this remission, in fact, the increasing remissions over time. This is very unlike any other kinds of treatments available currently. What will happen, as many of you know, who either take antidepressants or know others who take antidepressants, is that you may have an initial effect. You might feel an initial uplift from taking an antidepressant, but that may plateau out fairly soon, and then it might actually decrease to the extent where your doctor will then say, oh, we have to double your dose or try a different antidepressant. And there's very much a trial and error that goes on because no one really knows which antidepressant is going to work or if any will in fact work, which is why so few patients are being healed. Of course, there are some being healed through antidepressants and we um, fully acknowledge that, but we just need more tools in the toolkits of professionals. In this next slide, we talk a little about medicinal MDMA. And here we're talking about MDMA, not ecstasy. It's very important to make that distinction because MDMA um, is often vilified because it's um, used at dance parties and, and festivals and, and places, particularly where a lot of young people are, where it's adulterated by other um, drugs as well. So people are not actually taking pure MDMA. Also, that's in a recreational environment where often um, the people taking the MDMA are taking far too high doses. In a medical setting, MDMA is considered extremely safe. Professor David Nutt, one of our ambassadors, describes it as stunningly safe. Safer than <laughs> riding a bike or riding a horse or anything else like that. Alana, do you just want to mention how MDMA works in the brain? and why it works so effectively for therapy. Yeah, so it's an empathogen. So it, it, it really opens up uh, the capacity for, for the patient to be able to experience trauma without potentially going into uh, those PTSD responses and, and dissociation, anxiety attacks, etc. It creates a space to um, 
to have empathy for self and for others, to uh, process fear and, 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 ex and experience memories fully. And, and that is what we're needing to, to access when we're working with PTSD, particularly for, with MDMA, the capacity to, to face the experience safely and um, yeah, build, build trust and safety. Because of course, one of the things that happens, Alana, as, as you and other therapists would acknowledge is that normally speaking, if you ask a patient to talk about the trauma, it usually re-triggers the trauma. Absolutely. And as the um, it decreases the activity in the amygdala associated with trauma memory. targets. Right. So, so it's impossible to talk about the traumatic memory, therefore it's impossible to heal the trauma, mm -hmm. which is why PTSD is so difficult to treat. Mm -hmm. And in opening up the patient's through the loving awareness that is created through MDMA and the sense of connection and warmth. Safety. It, it, it creates this wonderful feeling of safety and the patient then is able to talk safely about their trauma. One of the things we do at Mind Medicine Australia is we show regular screenings of a Israeli documentary called Trip of Compassion, which follows three patients um, in a hospital in Israel um, being treated with MDMA therapy. And it's a very powerful treatment because all three patients come out fully healed and remain fully healed um, a year later. The wonderful statistics here that have led to the phase three trials currently being undertaken by MAPS are these phase two, two trial results, where 105 participants all with treatment resistant PTSD for an average of 18 years. Um, 52% went into remission immediately and 67% at the 12 month follow up. Quite remarkable, again, showing this increasing remission rate as people integrate these experiences in their lives. So what we're seeing now is that trials are being planned um, and already are underway for using these medicines for treatment of other conditions, including early stage dementia, anorexia and other eating disorders, obsessive compulsive disorder, alcohol addiction and other addictions. We're also seeing expanded access and compassionate use schemes all over the world, which are enabling physicians to apply to the regulator for approval to treat specific patients who are suffering from treatment resistant PTSD and depression. And Switzerland, Canada, the US are leading in that field. And we hope also to make sure that the special access scheme becomes available in Australia to specified prescribers, psychiatrists, for patients where all else has failed and the patient is in danger. So that will mean that these medicines can become available sooner than later to specific patients. We're also seeing the decriminalisation of these medicines in a number of American states. So the key questions for Australia is timeliness, availability and access. Also what we're seeing is these medicines are being researched and trials in, in, in really the leading universities and hospitals around the world, including Harvard, Yale, Oxford, and so on. And last year, two centers for psychedelic research were set up, one in London at Imperial College and one at Johns Hopkins University. And we're looking at setting up a third major centre of excellence in psychedelic medicine for the Asia Pacific based in Australia. And we're in advanced discussions with a number of universities on this very exciting prospect. And we'll talk about that. So of 110, well actually I think that's gone up to about 120 since this slide, current or recently completed clinical trials. Um, and you can see their numbers of trials for MDMA and psilocybin. Um, we are now back at levels of research and development um, that were we were at, at in 1970 when unfortunately Nixon had his war on drugs and prohibited all of these drugs which actually stopped all research. Uh, so it's, it's incredible to see now this renaissance in research in this space. The sad thing is is that we've had that 50-year hiatus where we've seen a massive spike in mental illness, loneliness, social isolation and disconnection caused by a variety of reasons, including acceleration of new technologies, ongoing disruption, and of course, major natural disasters, environmental anxiety, and numerous other things, proliferation of social media that really 
create a disconnect for many people who really need to connect as human social animals with one another in communities. We had the first Australian trial recently commenced at St Vincent's Hospital, which is part funded by Mind Medicine Australia. And this is a trial for patients who are experiencing depression and anxiety um, through an end of life diagnosis. And whilst it's not a particularly novel trial, it's wonderful to actually see Australia starting to have some trials taking place. And we look forward to seeing more trials taking place in Australia, particularly in novel areas. Historically, it's important to say that these medicines have been used uh, since ancient times. If you look at the ancient archeology, span you can see um, mushrooms, uh, you can read about um, many of the great philosophers talking about the Eleusinian mysteries, drinking honeyed psychedelic drinks. Um, in the 1950s and 60s, over 40,000 patients were healed through, for a variety of conditions through psychedelic therapies, and they were considered the next big thing in psychiatry. Dr. Stan Groff famously said psychedelics used responsibly and with proper caution would be for psychiatry what the microscope is for biology and medicine or the telescope is for astronomy. Unfortunately, what happened in the early 70s, late 60s, was that psychedelics got caught up in the war on drugs. And um, Nixon basically criminalized all use from 1970 and most other nations followed suit, particularly in Europe and Australia. That meant all research stopped. And unfortunately that was not based on science at all. Well, maybe it's fortunate it was not based on science because the science is still um, holds its integrity. But this was a political reason um, because he wanted to um, stop all of the anti-war demonstrations that were going on for the Viet Vietnam War. And his aides said, did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. I mean, this is an absolute travesty, travesty on humanity. And Professor David Nutt, our ambassador, says this is the worst censorship of research and medical treatment in the history of humanity. And we can only imagine that our world would be very different if these medicines had have remained available and continued being researched and trialled um, over the past 50 years. Anyway, we are where we are now and we need to make the best of the situation because we're in a crisis now and we need to manage that crisis. So Mind Medicine Australia has four key strategic pillars. The first of those is awareness and knowledge building. So we're holding educational um, events, screenings, a major international medical summit in November, which we're partnering with ACNEM on, and we're promoting and funding relevant novel research as well as starting state and regional chapters. So if any of you out there and feel like starting state and regional chapters or in New Zealand or Asia, and you want to start chapters where you are, please contact us and do join our events and our summit, which we hope will go on in November live with 15 of the leading researchers from around the world. We're also wanting to make sure that there's a pipeline of therapists available to use these medicines. So we're starting a professional development program in early 2021, a certificate in psychedelic assisted therapies. We've brought out Brené Harvey, a leading clinical psychologist from London, who worked on the psilocybin trials at Imperial College. And she's designing the course in association with the leading courses in psychedelic therapies around the world. We already have a wait list of over 250 GPs, psychiatrists, psychologists, drug and alcohol counsellors, nurses, and others who want to study that course next year. The Asia Pacific Centre of Excellence, which I mentioned before for applied research and development, development of supply chains for manufacturing the medicines in Australia, educating allied health professionals and, and health professionals, doing economic modelling on these medicines. And then of course, looking at the ethical and legal frameworks for these medicines and rollout of clinics and so on, so that we make sure that these medicines become available as soon as possible to those who are suffering. It's important to say that our focus is wholly clinical. We don't advocate for recreational use, and we're focused on these medicines being made available 
in medically controlled environment with medical professionals trained in these substances. So over 45% of us are going to experience a serious mental illness during their lifetime. What are we going to do about it, ladies and gentlemen? We are going to hopefully work together with all of you to develop a movement. And how you can help, start conversations, share this information, volunteer, start chapters, join our chapters. We have an amazing learn section on our website. We invite you to learn more. Talk to your doctors and medical professionals. Make sure they're up the curve about these medicines. Fundraise and donate because we are a charity and we desperately need support. Follow us on social media. Talk to your local MPs. Attend our educational events and more. And I think, Alana, you might want to mention briefly the psychological services program as well. Yes, yeah, so we've recently established a national uh, psychological services which involves offering therapy um, with psychologists, mental health social workers and psychotherapists for anyone who is uh, considering working with medicines or who, who is working with medicines. Although we don't obviously endorse any illegal use, we, we are here to support uh, people in Australia who are, who are on this path to, for treatment for their mental health and can do this through bulk billing, NDIS, private health insurance and other, other forms of payment. We also uh, have established Zoom groups for integration so that people around Australia can connect with like-minded people and be supported by professionals to integrate their experiences, as well as student study groups and peer supervision for uh, the network that we're building around Australia with allied health professionals. And we're also building a network of psychiatrists um, as well, so that's also very exciting. Uh, the summit will take place um, 16th to 19th of November. We'll include a two-day introductory workshop in psychedelic therapy for interested therapists and other members of the public, and then a two-day summit looking at the way forward for these medicines in Australia and preparing the Australian ecosystem, I guess, to lead the way in this space. This is some of the incredible speakers that we already have confirmed. So let's hope that our borders can open to allow these experts in to, to help further educate um, and inform Australia so that we can keep up or even maybe show some leadership to the rest of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, I wanna thank you very much. And I wanna thank Ron and all the team at ACNEM for supporting Mind Medicine Australia, including us in your dialogue. We applaud your innovation um, and innovative thinking to look at treatments that are going to help people at scale. And the reason why my husband and I started this is because we see this as a major paradigm shift. And there's a chance to really expand the treatment options available to practitioners. And we're very excited about that. So we urge you to get involved and support us. Thank you. Thank you, Alana. That was uh, most informative. And I actually did see that Israeli film in Sydney and it did yeah. show three cases, I think, from memory of first responder in a significant trauma. Another was a sexual abuse and the third one was a kidnapping. And uh, it was very powerful. It was a very powerful story of people that had been uh, going through trauma for many years and had broken through. So that was terrific. And your statistics about mental health and antidepressants. And it's interesting, isn't it, that uh, when independent research is done on antidepressants, not by the manufacturers themselves, the statistics are less than encouraging. Is that, am I reading that correctly? Alana, did you want to comment on that? I'm not sure what particular article you're referring to, but you know, all I can speak to is my, you know, my clinical experience, you know, working, working with people and, the, you know, paired with the, the remission rates on the side of, you know, only 30% of people that ex experience mental illness that antidepressants work for. Um, the majority of people, it's a Band-Aid. Yeah. And um, actually, the other point that you made, which I thought was really interesting, is the ethics of withholding simple, effective, safe, cost-effective treatment. Mm -hmm. where, where, do, where does the resistance come from? In, in terms of, of changing that paradigm? I think, you know, Australia has a natural conservatism. Um, 
possibly more conservative than a lot of other Western nations in this respect. Uh, for some reason, we haven't got over the stigma around these medicines and, and we're certainly starting to see that change now. And it's wonderful to be able to share as we're doing with you today, Ron, and, and all of your community, these sort of statistics, because it's by seeing the science that people start to really be educated. And we have to do that so that people go, oh, no, they, this is these hippy trippy, you know, psychedelics, they're gonna kill you. Or you see on the front page of, you know, the Australian or somewhere more MDMA deaths, for example. Mm -hmm. And they're not MDMA deaths, they're actually capsules that people are taking that have other things than just MDMA in them. They may not even have any MDMA in them at all, by the way. <laughs> they might have the tiniest component or the person may have had an overdose. And this is just because of lack of information, lack of education. Alana, did you want to comment on that further though as well? Just that, you know, Australia is typically quite a conservative society. And we saw that with the, you know, the gay and lesbian marriage debate where the public knew what it wanted, but it took a long time for Australia to change their their, I guess their policy around it, and this and is pill simple. testing as well as another example. Yeah. yeah, yep, and and pill testing exactly where the community knows what it wants, but the actual policy and, and laws are slow to follow. And luckily, we have the FDA uh, breakthrough therapy approval for this in America. And I'm really hopeful that Australia will start listening and and start leading the way with these medicines. And we have, I mean, we have had some very good conversations with the TGA um, that indicate that Australia will follow. The US in this respect um, and also in terms of the special access scheme and making sure that it becomes accessible to psychiatrists to heal this incredible suffering. So yeah, I think between us all and by building education and awareness, um, we can we can accelerate Australia and you know um, be Telling proud of what we can achieve going forwards. Mm -hmm. Well, I wanted to thank you both for, for joining us on the conference and presenting this really important and breakthrough um, initiative and congratulate you on doing that. And uh, we're going to have links to Mind Medicine Australia and the other resources that you've shared with us. So thank you so much for joining us today.